Two videos ago we showed that if we take a differential equation and apply second order accurate central difference finite difference approximations to that differential equation, we end up getting in step three of the numerical solution procedure a tridiagonal system of equations to solve. In the previous video we talked about some properties of those tridiagonal systems. In particular we looked at how well or ill conditioned they might be based on the values of the coefficients in the tridiagonal matrix. And here we're going to look at how we actually solve this using what's known as the Thomas algorithm. This is a very efficient technique. In fact, it's so efficient that in the future when we're doing more complicated two and three dimensional problems, we will often try to design an algorithm that takes a harder multidimensional problem, converts it into a tridiagonal system that we can use this very, very efficient Thomas algorithm to solve. So let's return to the general form of the tridiagonal system of equations that we had at the end of the video where we applied finite difference methods to the extended fin equation. And this is the tridiagonal system that we had. You'll remember this was for Dirichlet boundary conditions. We'll address the boundary condition issue in the next video and look at more general boundary conditions. But for now, we just have Dirichlet boundary conditions. So we have the A's, the B's, and the C's which can all now be different down the lower main and upper diagonals of our tridiagonal matrix. We have the unknown U values. Those are the solution values at each of the discrete grid points in the domain. And then we have the right hand side values, the D's. And you'll remember that we adjusted these for the fact that we know what U1 is and we know what U capital I plus one, the two endpoints, because of our fixed boundary conditions at the end of the extended fin. Okay, so our goal is to come up with an efficient algorithm for solving such a system of equations. It's known as the Thomas algorithm, and it's based on Gaussian elimination. Now, let me just say, you may have heard me say or read that the Gauss elimination procedure is actually very, very inefficient when implemented on a computer and applied to very, very large systems of equations. And that's true. So why are we using it here? The reason why we're using it here is because we have a relatively simple matrix problem to solve. Most of the values in our matrix are zeros. So many of the Gauss elimination steps that we would normally do for a full dense matrix don't need to be done. So we'll do the Gauss elimination. It consists of two steps, the forward elimination and the back substitution. The forward elimination is to get rid of the A's and then make all of the B's one. And then the back substitution will be to get the solution backwards for the values of u. So let's just walk through those. We'll go through the details. Again, it's just Gauss elimination applied specifically to a tridiagonal system of equations. So in the Ford elimination, we want to have a leading one in each row. We had a b2 here. So to make that a one, simply divide through the first row by b2. So we have one. And then the second element will be C2 divided by the B2. And then on the right hand side, we'll have the D2 minus A2U1 that we had before divided by the B2 again. And we'll call that delta 2. You'll notice that we're going to build up two arrays or two vectors, capital F and delta, as we go from the left to the right, from 2 to capital I. Then the next step will be to eliminate this element in our matrix. So to eliminate the A3, we multiply the first row by A3 and then subtract the two rows. When we do that, we get a zero here. We get a B3 minus A3 times F2, C3. And then this becomes a D3 minus A3 delta 2. The next step will be to make this a 1. So we divide through the second row by this quantity. That gives us a 1 and F3 which is C3 over the B3 minus A3 F2, and then the delta 3, which is what we had before, which was the D3 minus A3 delta 2, divided by this B3 minus A3 F2. The next step then is to get rid of this A4 and make it a zero. So we're gonna multiply this second row by A4 and subtract to give us a zero, and then a B4 minus A4 F3, C4, D4 minus A4, delta 3. Then to make this a 1, we divide by the B4 minus A4 F3 to give us a 1, capital F4, which you see here, delta 4, which you see here, using exactly the same process. We continue that process all the way through, row by row, to complete the forward elimination. So if you pull that together, 
the capital F1 is just 0. The delta 1 was just the value of u1, which is the solution at the left-hand side of our domain. And then f sub i and delta sub i are given by these recursion relations. Now we call them recursion relations because I have to do them one after the other. I have to get f1 and delta 1 before I can solve for f2 and delta 2, before I can solve for f3 and delta 3, and so forth. So when we run our index from 2 to capital I, so in order, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to capital I. When we complete that, we get the rho echelon form of our system of equations with zeros everywhere below the main diagonal, ones along the main diagonal, and then we do back substitution because we can solve the last equation, which is just 1 times u cap i is equal to delta sub cap i minus f sub i u sub i plus 1. So we can solve for u sub i, and it's simply this. And you'll notice it involves the value at the boundary, u sub i plus 1. So in the extended fin case, that's the temperature at the tip of the fin. So we get this from the boundary condition. And then we back substitute. Once I know u times capital I, I can use that with this term to get the u sub i minus 1. And then we continue to back substitute, back substitute, back substitute, till we get to the top. And then we have the, the solution for all the u's. So for example, from this second to last row, we determine that u sub capital I minus 1 is equal to delta sub capital I minus 1 minus capital F sub capital I minus 1 times u sub cap I. And if we generalize that, it's going to look exactly the same. Just put in the index little i, be ui equals delta sub i minus cap F sub i times u sub i plus 1. Then you'll notice the order of the index goes from capital I down to 2. So the forward elimination step, we go forward from 2 to capital I. And the back substitution step, we go backwards from capital I down to 2. And we do need the values of the next u, i plus 1, in order to get ui. And then we need that one to get the next one, next one, next one. Again, going in reverse order from capital I to 2. So if you summarize those two steps, the forward elimination, you have your capital F1, delta 1 comes from the boundary condition, and then the fi, delta i expressions. Again, these simple recursion expressions that you build up to three, four, up to capital I. Once you've completed this, you then have an array or a vector of all the f values and all the delta values. Those then get used in the back substitution step. You start at the right end of the domain at u sub cap i plus one, which is the right boundary condition, and then you work your way backwards to get the solution used in terms of the deltas and the f's that you've built up in the forward elimination step and the solution that you just obtained at the next point to the right. So let me finish with some comments and remarks about the Thomas algorithm. First of all, the, the thing that we care about most is how good is it? How efficient is it really when we implement this on a computer? It turns out that it only requires order capital I operations. So that's the best scaling we could hope for. So linear scaling is the best we can hope for. Double the size of the problem, double the number of iterations that we would have to perform. That's the best we could hope for. Gauss elimination on a general dense matrix requires capital N or capital I cubed operations. So as the size of the matrix goes up, if I were to double the number of unknowns, then that would increase by a factor of eight to cubed the number of op operations and the computational time that I'd have to wait to get the solution. So n cubed is a very poor scaling. n, or i, is optimal linear scaling. So in other words, you really can't do any better than the Thomas algorithm in terms of the number of operations and how that scales with the size of the problem. I mentioned at the outset of the video that the Thomas algorithm is so efficient that in the future, even when we have more complicated problems to solve, in that step three of the numerical solution procedure, we'll often look for ways that we can take this harder problem and turn it into simply the need to solve a whole bunch of tridiagonal problems. Here it's just one tridiagonal problem. But because it's so efficient, I would much rather solve a whole bunch of tridiagonal problems, not only in terms of efficiency and computational time, in terms of storage requirements, we can economize on that as well for this tridiagonal system. In other words, rather than storing the whole entire matrix, all capital N by capital N elements, because most of them are just zeros, 
we can simply store the three diagonals, the A's, the B's, and the C's, as vectors, as arrays. So a vector array for A, vector array for B, vector array for C. Just fill up those three vectors and pass them to the Thomas algorithm. And the Thomas algorithm, that's all the information it needs. There's no need to store all those additional zeros. You can develop similar algorithms for other banded matrix. For example, a pentadiagonal matrix would have five non-zero diagonals instead of three. It'll take more time. It won't be as efficient as the Thomas algorithm, but nevertheless, you can develop similar techniques and algorithms for other banded matrices. Now, one thing to keep in mind, remember our discussion about round off errors and conditioning and so forth? Whenever we talk about these algorithms, be thinking in your mind, picture in your mind, the effect of and how round off errors could build up. So you'll notice, for example, as we do the forward elimination step, we're building up the F and delta as we go along. So whatever error is introduced in F2 is propagated into F3. Additional error in F3 is propagated into four. So the round off errors are being built up as we move from left to the right in the forward elimination. Same thing in the backward substitution. The errors are compounding as we move back towards the left boundary of the domain. So again, just think about how these round off errors can build up in the algorithm and of course ways to try to mitigate that.